the PowerPoint going. Statistical conclusion validity. So what makes an experiment valid? We've been talking about the different types of validity construct. Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. I'm sorry. Uh, at least in uh, 430. Internal, external, ecological, and now we're down to statistical conclusion validity. Uh, that is was the correct statistical test used correctly. That's really the easy way of summing up statistical conclusion validity. Uh, so the important things about statistical conclusion validity are correctly using statistical tests. That is using the right test for the right data and the right situation and meeting assumptions of the test. Making sure that you have adequate statistical power which makes, you know, which requires you to understand what effect size is, effect size and uh, st significance and error variance. And finally, managing error variance is important when we're talking about power and effect size and, you know, statistical conclusion validity. So we'll talk about that. So, uh, are you using the tests correctly and uh, are the statistical assumptions being met? Uh, it comes down to this. Uh, whenever you have a statistical test, uh, you will have, for example, they actually have it in the introduction, assumptions underlying the test. And so, uh, you know, when you use a test, make sure you understand the assumptions and make sure that you meet all of the assumptions and we'll be covering that in you know lab uh, this semester in 430. So uh, read up on the assumptions of the different tests that we're going to use. Uh, statistical power. Uh, do you have enough statistical power? And so statistical power is a uh, the ability of a test to correctly reject a false null hypothesis. So of course we're talking about hypothesis testing and our decision rules and you know statistical power uh, is the probability that you are here in the cell for the correct uh, rejection or the correct decision uh, and uh, you know you, know, you should have a statistical power based on your effect size and your error variance and everything else that is appropriate for what you're working with. Uh, a, you know, statistical power is based on the number of subjects, the effect size, the level of er error variance, and the alpha level. And as a researcher, you have a lot under your control. Uh, Obviously, alpha level is under your control. Uh, the number of subjects is under your control. Uh, so you can control this and set this wherever you want. You can change your alpha level. You can change the number of subjects. Uh, you may think that effect size and error variance are things that you don't have control over. And in general, you don't. Uh, the effect size is the size of the effect that you see in the phenomenon and you may not have that much control over it. Uh, the error variance is the amount of variance, you know, error variance in your experiment and you may think you don't have that much control over it but I'm going to be getting to situations where we see that we do have control over these two things. Uh, that is, uh, while you think it, the ex effect size is just what happens, you can control how you present the independent variable. You can uh, control how you measure the independent variable. And by doing those things, you can influence the effect size. You can do things experimentally that would strengthen or weaken the effect size. And then likewise, you can do things experimentally that would you know, increase or decrease error variance. And I'll be getting to that at the end of this lecture. And so all of these uh, allow us to calculate pro a power, uh, which is the probability of a correct hit that is getting into this cell here. And the higher, the better. Uh, Cohen uh, says that we should have at least 80%, which means that if 
uh, the null hypothesis is false, we have an 80% chance of detecting it and rejecting the null hypothesis in our statistical test. But the higher is better. Uh, Cohen is saying that 80% is the lowest level that would be acceptable to a researcher who doesn't want, want to waste their time doing research with a weak, powerless statistical test. Uh, so just to remind you, but I hope that you've reviewed things from research methods and uh, you know statistics, effect size is the strength of the IV on the DV. It's the distance of the control group and the experimental group's means from each other. To go for examples where we have you know mean scores, which is most of the situations in you know research psychology, how far apart they are. Uh, so that's one of the things that we goes into you know calculating statistical power. Error variance is a reflection of the effect of the extraneous variables in the experiment. Experiment. Uh, it's the variance in the subject scores, not due to the independent variable, but to all of the other variables in the experiment, such as the extraneous variables. And I hope you know what the number of subjects in alpha level are. So, effect size is a, qu a quantitative measure of the strength of a phenomenon. Quantitative means number, so we're talking about we're going to get a number value of how strong the distance between the two means are, and of a phenomenon, that means the action of an IV on a DV. So whenever we talk about an experiment, we're talking about the experiment studying a phenomenon. Uh, when you do a study on the fundamental attribution error, the phenomenon is the fundamental attribution error. Uh, when you look at coping uh, based on social support, the phenomenon is you know, emotional so social support on coping. Uh, the effect size that we calculate, that is these uh, numbers that we calculate, are dimensionless. That is, uh, you can compare across different experiments that have different types of dependent variables. So let's say that one study uh, has a dependent variable which is on a 1 to 7 scale, and so the mean difference for uh, the control condition and the experimental condition are you know, 0.89 units. And you have another study where the DV is on a 1 to 100 scale. And so the mean difference between the control and experimental condition is uh, you know, uh, you know, 7.5 units. Uh, you can't compare those numbers raw. But once we calculate an effect size, we can compare the effect size numbers from those two different experiments. So effect sizes allow us to compare apples to oranges. What is an effect size? How can you intuitively understand it? Uh, back in 2008, uh, the presidential election, uh, Barack Obama won 68% of the popular vote. John McCain won 32%. That's a 0.36 or a 36% difference. That's the effect size. That is, that's the size of the effect of Obama's win over McCain. And back in 2012, we had a 24% effect size. So we can compare uh, the size of the wins of Obama in 2008 and 2012. Obama had a much larger win over McCain than he did Romney. So this is an intuitive way you can think about effect sizes. That is, how big a difference between, you know, and we can use them to compare across different situations. Let's take this now into psychology. Uh, so we have a study looking at cartoon violence on children's aggression. And so what we do is we show kids in one condition violent uh, cartoons, another condition nonviolent cartoons, and then we uh, count the number of aggressive acts they make in 30 minutes. And so we see that uh, the mean for the violent cartoon group is 3.2 acts per uh, 30 minutes, nonviolent group 2.6. And you notice they have these uh, standard deviations here. Uh, calculating, uh, so the difference between the two means is 0.6. 
but what we do is we standardize these this difference here of 0.06 based on the standard deviations and so Cohen's D which is the measure we use for t-tests and this would be analyzed with the t-test it gives us a uh, effect size of 0.86 and uh, the D score that is Cohen's D uh, one D score equals one standard deviation difference uh, between the means of the control and experimental conditions uh, and Cohen suggests these rubrics for analyzing effect sizes or evaluating effect sizes a small D score of 0.2 uh, would indicate that the effect that is how big was this difference. Uh, this was a small difference. 0.5 or so is a large diff is a medium difference, excuse me, and 0.8 is a uh, large difference. And we see that in the example I gave, the Cohen's D was 0.86. So that is a large effect of watching violent cartoons on aggressive acts. Other rubrics that we will use, other measures that we will use uh, in ANOVA, we'll use eta squared, that's an eta. Uh, and eta squared runs from one to zero. It's a measure of proportion of the explained variance. Uh, so out of, all the uh, out of all the variance in the experiment, how much is explained by the independent variables? Uh, small effect would be uh, eta squared of 0.01 medium 0.06 and large 0.14. Uh, in correlation, good old Pearson's R is a measure of uh, effect size. Uh, it goes from minus 1 to 1. Uh, the uh, absolute value of uh, Pearson's R uh, is a measure of the proportion of covariance to variance. That is out of all the variance in the experiment how much of it is shared between the IV and the DV. And you probably run across this before the rubric uh, points are 0.1 for, is a small effect size. So when something's correlated with an R of you know, 0.1 or negative 0.1, that's a small effect. When it's 0.3 or so, that's a medium effect. And 0.5 or above is a large effect. And what's more, when we're looking at effect sizes in a study which has an effect size of 0.6, uh, the means of the two groups are 0.45 and 3, standard deviations uh, 0.25 and 0.25. This is what it looks like. Uh, that is, you have two groups here. Uh, group 1. Oh, I don't know why that happened that little jag to the left. Uh, that's 0.45. Uh, group 2 is 3. And I always like to do this graphically to point out that yes indeed uh, group 1 has a higher mean than group 3. Uh, but look at all the spread that is the variation around the means. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap here in the dark green. And you know you have to remember that when we talk about effects and phenomena in psychology, we, we say, for example, to put it in a very intuitively understandable way, uh, there's a significant difference between men and women in terms of mathematical ability or spatial ability in that men score higher than women. Well, yeah, that's true, but there's all this overlap. And so, for example, we can see here, let's say that going with my example, group one is men and group three, group two, excuse me, group three, group two is uh, women. And so here is the mean uh, for men on uh, you know mathematical abilities per se and now we look here all of these women 
are scoring above the average for men on mathematical ability. And so that makes you, you should stop and think about what we're really talking about when we're talking about effect sizes and when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, distributions and somebody doing better than somebody else. It doesn't, we're dealing with distributions here which are randomly and normally distributed around the means. So we really have to be cautious about interpreting things such as, well, men are just better than women in mathematical ability. That statement is false, even though the research shows that men score higher on, on average on tests of mathematical ability than women. And then we're not even, whoops, <laughs> getting into the other uh, aspects about the, those data. And uh, another thing I like to go off on is effect size versus statistical significance. So here's this example study again. And we have 50 students in two groups. Uh, so uh, I think this is something messed up here, uh, but let's say that we have a p that's less than 0.05, uh, then uh, what that means is that it's statistically significant. Statistically significant, and we often drop the statistical, but sig statistically significant means the effect is reliable. And by reliable, I mean that if we would conduct this experiment again with 50 students uh, drawn from the same population, we are going to most likely get the same pattern of results. That is, the violent group will be higher than the nonviolent group in terms of aggression on the playground. That's what reliable means. We can do this experiment over again and we're probably going to get the same result. Uh, if it's not significant, then that means we could do this experiment over again and we'll probably get a different result. Maybe the means will be the same. Maybe they'll be reversed. That's what statistically significant means. Effect size means how large the effect is. And you can talk about very small effects and you can talk about very large effects. Uh, and very large effects you may want to pay more attention to because if you do this, then the outcome is much more diverse and much more surprising. Or a small effect, if you do something, you'll only see a small change in, in behavior. And likewise, we could have non-significant uh, you know, results with a small effect size or non-significant results with a large effect size. And what this means is it's non-significant, so if we do this experiment again, we're uncertain about the outcomes of the you know, descriptive data that we're going to get. Uh, because non-significant means non-reliable or non-replicable, which means if we do this experiment again, we're not probably not going to get the same uh, results in the sample. And the effect size is a sample statistic. So we make it uh, you know, uh, you know, a small effect size this time, we may get uh, a negative effect size next time. We may get a large effect size this time. Next time we may get none. Significant means that the you know, uh, data in the sample is likely to be you know, obtained again if we conduct the experiment the same way and draw different people from the same population. So if I do an experiment and we get a small effect size, and it's significant, I would expect a small effect size if I conduct this experiment again. Uh, if you get a large effect size, I would expect an experiment where I get a large effect size again. Uh, and uh, that's what significant means. Remember that significant means reliable. Or replicable. That is, you can replicate, that is, conduct again and get generally the same results. Some more things about uh, effect size and statistical significance. 
all things being equal, large effect sizes lead to, you know, if you want to say greater significance, I'm going to say eh, no, uh, because you can't use more significant, less significant. That's not right. Significance is a decision you make. You know, uh, you say to yourself, you know, you, somebody says to me, do you want to go get, uh, get ice cream or do you want to go get bubble tea? So I have a decision to make. And your answer should be bubble tea or ice cream. And you should not say something, I'm more likely to want to get bubble tea. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. We want a decision from you. And that's what significance is. It's a, deci it's a decision. And so the correct way to talk about this is larger effect sizes, all things being equal, lead to higher statistical power. And higher statistical power are going to be more likely to find significance if it actually exists. Uh, larger ends, larger sample sizes, leads to higher statistical power. And then finally, smaller error variance leads to higher statistical power. So smaller variance leads to higher statistical power, uh, which leads to uh, you know, more likely finding uh, significance. Uh, small n leads to higher statistical power, which leads to being more likely to find, uh, you know, uh, sig uh, higher levels of significance, or st excuse me, significant, see I do it, statistical power. And then larger effect sizes lead to higher statistical power. In fact, I screwed that up so much, I'm gonna go back and edit it. So let me go back. And a few other things about effect size and significance, things that you, you need to know. All things being equal, cateris paribus, uh, that's Latin for all things being equal. Uh, uh, larger effect sizes leads to greater significance. Ooh, I shouldn't say that. And if you say that, I'm going to mark you wrong. Uh, significance is a decision. Uh, that is, you decide if a finding is significant or not based on your decision rule. And saying more significant or less significant doesn't make sense because it's a decision and you can't talk about a decision in terms of uh, more or less, you know, you know, decision. For example, you say, hey Bill, do you want to go out for ice cream or you want to go get some bubble tea? And the answer you want is bubble tea or ice cream. A decision. You want a decision. If I say, I'm much more likely to want to get bubble tea, and you're going to say, well, what does that mean? That's crazy talk. You want a decision. So we don't talk about more significance or less significance or kind of significant or close to significant. We talk about uh, a decision we make. Based on our decision rule, we're going to decide that this result is significant and replicable or it's not significant and most likely is not going to be replicable. The term that we should use is statistical power because if something is, uh, you know, uh, you remember statistical power is the ability to detect a false null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is false, uh, the more power we have, the more likely we would make the decision that that is significant. So what we should talk about is statistical power. Some things have more statistical power, some things have less statistical power. It's not a decision, it's amount, an amount. So we can say larger effect sizes lead to higher statistical power. In general, all things being equal, uh, more, you know, more, uh, larger effect sizes, higher effect sizes, will lead to higher statistical power. Likewise, larger sample sizes lead to higher statistical power, and smaller error variance leads to higher statistical power. So if you want to have good statistical power, here are some things that you can do to make sure that you have good statistical power. Uh, have a good effect size, have a higher sample size, a larger sample size, and recruit, uh, re reduce error variance. 
Uh, error variance, just to remind you, uh, we have the total variance in an experiment. That's the uh, effect variance, that is the variance associated with the effect, and the error variance, the variance associated with everything else. So uh, the T statistic is a good example of an inferential statistic uh, in that the numerator is looking at the effect variance or a measure of the effect. And here we see you know, the mean of group one minus the mean of group two. That's a measure of the effect. And then the denominator is a measure of error variance. And so what we're doing in the T value is we're dividing the effect variance by the error variance. And if uh, there's more effect variance than the error variance, we're going to get a, a positive T value. The more that the, the, there's effect variance than error variance, you're going to get a higher T value, and that means more power. Uh, and so error variance is the variance due to error. Uh, this comes from things such as all of the uh, extraneous variables in the experiment and also uh, measurement error. Uh, error variance is a reflection of the effect of the extraneous variables in the experiment. Uh, so the variance in the subject scores not due to the independent variable, but they're due to the other variables, the extraneous variables, such as using an unreliable measure, a measure with low reliability, using an invalid measure, a measure with low construct validity, uh, an error in the manipulation, such as using an unstandardized manipulation, uh, participant differences, any differences which are not part of the independent variable that have to do with participants, their gender, if gender is not an independent variable, their race, if race is not an independent variable, their academic major, if academic major is not their independent variable. And then history effects, that is effects that occur in the experiment uh, that are just crazy or uncontrolled, uh, truly extraneous. For example, you are running subjects uh, in the lab uh, in groups of 10, and in one of the groups of 10, uh, in the control group, you have one student who coughs during the entire experiment. That is a difference from the control group, and that will have possibly some error effect uh, in the scores of the subjects. How much, we don't know, and that's a problem. And hopefully you're starting to notice that this lecture on statistical conclusion validity is using a lot of the terms from the other lectures on validity and history effects. And this all ties together very, very tightly. OK, so let's go back to statistical power. So as I said before, Cateris paribus, uh, you know, larger sample sizes lead to higher power. Uh, larger effect sizes uh, lead to higher power. Smaller error variance leads to higher power. Uh, so what that means is uh, this. Extraneous variables increase error variance and lower statistical power. Ah, so these extraneous variables are bad. Yeah, uh, extraneous variables may become confounded and decrease internal validity. So another way in which uh, you know, extraneous variables are bad you may have a lack of internal validity. Uh, so extraneous variables seem to be bad. However, external validity means having examples of different frames in the experiment. That is, frames such as you know, different types of uh, people, different genders, different races of people, different settings. These frames are all extraneous variables. So on one hand, we have extraneous variables being bad and extraneous variables being good. And so high internal validity usually means low external validity because we increase the internal validity by hammering down these extraneous variables. We have similar types of people in the experiment that will 
increase the internal validity. Uh, that will increase the statistical power also. Uh, and so therefore, uh, having good internal and statistical conclusion validity usually means lowering your external validity. And high external validity usually means lowering your statistical power because you increase uh, the number of different types of people in your experiment at least and that introduces the variance associated with the subjects. You use different situations that increases the variance associated with subjects being tested in different situations and that will lower your statistical power. And so what it comes down to is that a major part of error variance is subject variance. Oh, I'm sorry, and I'm going to go back and correct this. And let me just be very you know, direct about this. Uh, a major part of error variance in experiments is subject variance. And this can be in from several different examples uh, or several different sources. One source of subject-related error variance is the differences in different types of people, different categories of people, men versus women, uh, African Americans versus Caucasian Americans, uh, psychology majors versus art majors. And then another source of you know, error variance is just the differences between uh, people because they're people. If you have a group of white males who are all psych majors, they're not all the same. And those differences will probably show up in your dependent variable and that will increase the error variance in a variable in a study. You know, for example, you can use this in a couple different ways. Uh, in one study, I was doing it on uh, belief in a just world on blame attributions, and I was doing the experiment with male and female subjects. Now, uh, because I had male and female subjects, I had higher external validity because I could generalize the results to males and females. Uh, however, because I had males and females, I had higher uh, error variance because men versus women were behaving differently, and I had lower statistical power. And so one thing that you could do is you could redo this experiment and just use female subjects. And this would lower the external validity because now you're just using female subjects so you can only generalize your results to females. However, because you're only just using one type of gender, females, uh, you lower your error variance and that, all things being equal, increases your statistical power. Wow. So. Uh, these are very important issues that you need to think about when planning a study. Uh, other ways that you can go about doing this is that you could, back in the original study, you could add gender, oh I can't really write with a, ma with a mouse, so that's a G for gender. You could add gender as an independent variable, and once gender becomes an independent variable, you now are able to control for or label the error variance related to being male versus female. The problem is that now you add, you lower uh, the degrees of freedom uh, from the error variance and that will mean that you're doing a lower degree of freedom test on your when you do your uh, statistical tests. Let me be very clear and give you an example about the relationship between extraneous variables and power. And this is really an important part of talking about statistical conclusion validity. 
uh, a major part of error variance is subject variance. And subject variance is like the big problem in psychological research and statistics. And here's how it plays out in terms of, you know, error variance and methodology. Uh, and here, you know, let's use an example from one of my studies. I was doing a study once. It was a pilot study and it had one independent, no, yeah, it was a pilot study and had one independent variable. And it was the effect of belief in a just world on blame attributions. And I had male and female subjects. And I could not find a significant effect. It was close to being significant. Oh, I shouldn't talk like that. You know, the, the uh, you know, uh, F value was close to being significant uh, or to being where I would determine it was significant, but not really quite. And I tried methodological things to, you know, improve that. Now, what I did was I reran it with just female subjects. And I did, you know, find a significant effect. And here's what happened. Uh, when uh, I was using male and female subjects, I had higher error variance. And the reason why is males and females were responding uh, to uh, the belief in the just world scale and the blame attribution situations in, total, in very different ways. But male and female gender was not a independent variable, was not an independent variable. Uh, so all of the variance due to male and femaleness was put down into the uh, error variance of the study and the larger the denominator, the larger the error variance, uh, the lower the statistical power would be. So because of that I had low statistical power and could not get anything to be significant. Why is my mouse doing that? I pretty much know why it's cat hair. Luna loves to lay on my computer and I get cat, cat hair in my optical mouse. However, having male and female subjects in that experiment meant that it automatically had higher external validity because you can uh, generalize to uh, examples that you have in your study. So if I have males and females in my study, I can generalize to males and females outside of the study. So when I reran it with just female subjects, uh, I had lower external validity because now with only female subjects in it, I could only generalize to other females. So I couldn't say anything about what this means about males, so I had lower external validity. But because I ran it with just females, or just women, uh, I had lower error variance because there was no variance due to being male or female. I had taken it out of the experiment. And so it had higher statistical power and it was more likely to reach levels where I would deem it significant. And that's a, you know, a methodological way that you could affect uh, you know, things such as error variance and you know, uh, statistical power. But it has an effect, for example, on uh, validity, external validity. Uh, there's other ways you can do this also. Uh, you may have been noticing or you may have put together the way I've been saying things. Uh, what if, you know, I made this conclusion from the way I've been saying things, what if this was like a one independent variable study and this was on uh, different types of blame attributions? And so what if, for example, or you know, different levels, excuse me, of belief in a just world, what if I created a second independent variable and that second independent variable was gender? Well, gender would no longer be an extraneous variable, it would be an a independent variable. And so all of the variance would leave the error term and go into the uh, term for that second independent variable. And indeed you can do this. The problem is that it changes the degrees of freedom of your error term and it makes it harder uh, to get to a level where you would deem an F value or a T value significant. So 
this is actually a trade-off just within statistical conclusion validity. You can you know, uh, lower your general error by making a lot of different things that were extraneous variables independent variables, but for every extra independent variable you add, you uh, increase the dependent uh, the degrees of freedom of your error term, and that makes it harder uh, to uh, you know, deem something statistically significant because it raises the critical value. And if you're interested in that, uh, talk to me about that outside of the class, especially when we get to ANOVA. And I can easily demonstrate that to you uh, looking at a F uh, critical table. So uh, where does that leave us? That is, uh, we can't do the perfect experiment. That's where it leaves us. We're using these different types of validity to evaluate experiments, and we can't have an experiment with high internal, high external, high statistical conclusion validity all at the same time. And so we can't, since we can't do the perfect experiment, what we do is converging operations. That is, we do different experiments on the same phenomenon using different methods. For example, one time you may do an experiment, and usually the first experiment, you're going to want to have high internal validity. Because if you want to investigate a phenomenon, you want to know it's there or not, and so you're going to focus on internal validity. Because of that, the focus on internal validity, you're going to have low external validity, most likely. Uh, but also, you'll probably have high statistical conclusion validity, which is good. Uh, because you're going to have low error variance. Okay, so once you discover the phenom phenomenon exists, remember the Muppets phenomenon. Da, 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 phenomenon. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm sorry. Got to get that out once a uh, semester. So uh, once you know the phenomenon exists, and internal validity is really good for that. Uh, that sounds like a good test question. Uh, so once you know that the phenomenon exists then you want to see uh, you know, if it exists and can be generalized to different people, different settings, and different times. Uh, and you do the next couple experiments with high external validity, but of course you know you're going to have low internal validity, you're going to have errors and extraneous variables that you know, make it difficult to interpret the results, and also you're going to have higher error variances, making your statistical power uh, lower, and making it harder to deem that the results are significant. But that's generally how we have to do it. And that's why I emphasize converging operations so much. And that is really the heart of research methodology that is looking at all these different types of validity realizing you can't have a perfect experiment. And so we have to do experiments through converging operations, replicating the experiment, changing something to increase the internal validity or decrease the external validity, and then another converging operation where we increase the external validity at the cost of in internal validity. So all of these concepts from statistics and from Psych 330 they all tie together in a really nice package. That is, the, way, the reason why we do research in these slow step-by-step -step process of converging operations or programmatic research or replications or you know, conceptual replications is because the problem with validity is so bad, we cannot do the perfect experiment. We have to do different experiments looking at different parts of the puzzle. All right, so that's it. Hopefully this didn't turn out to be too long. Uh, I'll see you in class.